I'm a developmental and educational psychologist and my research also touches economic freedom. For example, in my last paper co-authored with Thomas Coyle, uh, we found out that economic freedom boosts the effect of cognitive ability. The, uh, the higher the level of economic freedom, the stronger are the effects of cognitive um, ability. I want to speak today about um, immigration and the effects of immigration and what uh, can be done. And these are my four main central co concepts. First, people's attributes are decisive for the fate of nations. Not institutions, people create their institutions, but the important background factor are the attributes of peoples. Peoples differ in these attributes. These patterns are roughly stable across environment and time. They are not totally stable and there are mean changes, but the patterns are roughly stable. And conc the conclusion is if peoples are changing in a region, in a geographical area, in a state, in a country, the aspects of a country will accordingly change, for example, the political institution, the economy, productivity, and so on. And this I will show with empirical data um, and at the end, I want to give uh, some suggestions. I deal with, the, with a psychological view on human capital uh, studies. And what is human capital? Human capital is all what is important for being a productive member of society, especially in the economy. And what are the psychological attributes important here? Cognitive ability, covering intelligence, knowledge on the intelligent use of knowledge. Industrious discipline, something like diligence and conscientiousness, physical attributes, health, hearing ability, then personality and attitudes like agreeableness, and special competence like social competence. They are all imp important not only for the economy, not only for jobs, but also for life. And there are many studies, for example, from Gary S. Becker showing that these attributes are important for individual success. This approach is nothing new. It can be traced back to Adam Smith. What is, in his view, human capital, these are the acquired and useful abilities of all the inhabitants or members of the society. And important here, and it's not a, an individual approach, it's also, or not only individual, it's also an uh, approach at the level of society, and we will later continue at this level. What are these useful abilities according to Adam Smith? The qualities most useful to ourselves are, first of all, superior reason and understanding. That is cognitive ability and intelligence, by which we are, able, we are able of discerning the remote consequences of all our actions and of foreseeing the advantage or detriment which is likely to result uh, from them. So you can see the future, you can plan, you can anticipate what will happen if you do A or B. And secondly, self-command, by which we are enabled to abstain from present pleasure or to endure present pain in order to obtain a greater pleasure or to avoid a greater pain in some future time. In psychology, we term this today delay of gratification or e economics, uh, uh, similarly, and time preference. Cognitive ability covers intelligence, the true, the store and tr of true and relevant knowledge, and the intelligent use of this knowledge and intelligence itself means to you thinking to solve problems, to be able to reason, to make inductive and deductive logical conclusions, to be able to think abstractly, to categorize, to make uh, uh, correct categories, to process abstract information like math, and, and to understand, to understand structures, to build structures, to find meaning, to construct meaning, to have insight. <clears throat> And this cognitive ability or intelligence is very predictive. This means statistically correlated with positive results in an individual life. Individuals with higher intelligence or cognitive ability have show better job performance, higher income. They show less traffic accidents, less violation of speed limits, less traffic fat fatalities. They live longer, this correlation of 0.18. This is their intelligence was measured at the age of 11. And then they looked how long the people lived. This is a Scottish study. And the, the boys and girls with higher intelligence, they lived longer. 
Higher intelligence is also negatively correlated with out of wedlock birth, with teen birth, also high intelligence less, less out of wedlock birth, less teen birth. Positive correlated with moral judgment, with moral behavior, negatively with crime, positively with political participation, they go more voting, and positively with a preference for economic freedom. This all looks like as if intelligence is correlated and additionally it has an effect on a burger lifestyle, which is, which is good for individual success and uh, beneficial individual success and success, success of society. Why is cognitive ability relevant? First of all, it helps to be successful in selection process. If you are smart, you are good in education, you're good in university, and you will achieve higher degrees. And if you have a higher degree, formal degree, you have the possibility to work in jobs with less, you know, less, which are less dangerous and you have more income. Additionally, it is an indicator of health. People who are smart are also health in health, more healthy in, in other aspects. But the most important factor, the most important reason why um, cognitive ability has a positive impact is because it improves problem solving, insight, foresight, rationality, what is called phronesis in the old Greek term, which is all relevant to be successful in the job or to achieve high income or to manage one's wealth, to be a good driver and to be a, a smart uh, 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 and good uh, citizen. And the same we can found at the inter international level. The, at the level of, of countries, but, at a, but with higher correlations. Why? I will explain later. The average ability level of a nation, measured by psychometric intelligence tests or student assessment tests, is positive correlated with GDP, very high correlation here of 0.76, even higher if it's locked, um, positive correlated with wealth, positive correlated with longevity, countries with a higher cognitive ability level, average higher uh, cognitive ability level, on average, people live longer. With hate as an indicator of, of long-term wealth, is positive correlated with technological security, airlines less crash down in road, less road uh, accidents and um, less uh, accidents uh, in, uh, in the world of work. Positive correlated with innovation, negative with AIDS, murder and corruption, positively with government effectiveness, rule of law, political freedom, economic freedom, and meritorious principles that say the people who achieve more will gain more, will have a higher social position. And these correlations are very robust ac across different indicators of ability, uh, these different indicators of these, of these um, aspects across different paradigms uh, found by economists and by psychologists. They are very, very, very uh, uh, robust. There is no replication crisis as in other social sciences and in psychology. This does not mean that institutions are totally irrelevant. This I want to stress. We have, of course, evidence that, for example, capitalism is important. Uh, in the South Korea, the people are higher, uh, taller, are taller than in um, uh, North Korea. In the former East Germany, people were smaller. And then in West Germany, I published this uh, seven years ago, and the last president of the former socialist uh, East Germany country then has publicly, uh, has then criticized me in the public because I have shown such anti-socialist empirical data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was Egon Krenz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we know there is research showing that European institutions still have a positive impact today in, in, the, in the developing world. Uh, a long hist history of English and French colonization le leads to higher GDP today and lower child mortality. But for understanding today's economic and political differences between countries, cognitive human capital and a special level of its elites is, is crucial. Here is a path analysis. In psychology, we frequently use path analysis. Uh, here are the, the, relation or the, re the relations between variables are um, uh, calculated um, considering the, the uh, correlations with other variables. And we usually interpret these uh, effects as causal effects. But of course, we need additional evidence to interpret them as causal effects. We have here on the left, we have cognitive ability. 
Here in parentheses, we have correlations. They vary between minus 1, 0, and plus 1. And here, in front of the parentheses, we have the uh, path effects or the, 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 the regression coefficients. They also usually vary between minus 1, 0, and plus 1. Yet the larger the number, the stronger is the statistical effect. Cognitive ability is highly correlated with the cognitive ability level of the elite, has a positive impact on the competence level of, of leading politicians, a positive impact on government effectiveness, on economic freedom, on competitiveness, on innovation, on productivity, and at the end leading to higher wealth. And if you compare the effect of cognitive ability with the effect of economic freedom, then today, to understand the wealth differences or productivity differences between countries, it is more important to look at the cognitive ability level and less at economic freedom. Other variables in this model are not important. For example, if a country is in, in, in Africa, it has no impact if you consider all the other variables. The absolute latitude of a country, if it's in the south or north or near to the equator, not important at all. Here. This, this, and natural resource rents is also not important, but of course, there are some countries who are only rich due to oil. Some exceptions always exist. This was a cross-sectional analysis, and now let's look at a longitudinal analysis. A longitudinal analysis means that we can analyze the rate, rate reciprocal effects, that cognitive ability has an effect on wealth, and wealth also on cognitive ability, or that economic freedom has an effect on uh, wealth and ability and vice versa. And here we see cognitive ability has a positive effect on economic freedom, very large. And economic freedom has also a positive effect on cognitive human capital. That means in freer countries, cognitive ability develops more positively. People, more, for example, more invest in education or uh, more in, in diligence. But much more important is the effect of cognitive ability on economic freedom. More smarter countries will create institutions leading to more economic freedom. Cognitive ability has also a positive impact on wealth, but wealth has also a positive impact on cognitive human capital. And I will show this in two slides. There are different effects at different wealth levels. The correlations between cognitive human capital and wealth are increasing across time. From 1970 to 2010, across 40 years, the correlations are rising. This means that in modern society, more and more important becomes cognitive ability level to achieve wealth and I adopt this cognitive capitalism. <clears throat> so we have not only positive effects on economy, but also on politics. Cognitive human capital leads to more positive politics, more rule of law, more uh, um, political freedom, and more um, democracy. When I gave my first talk in English 10 years ago in San Francisco, I dealt with uh, positive effects of intelligence and education and democracy, but my pronunciation was much worse than today, and I spoke 20 minutes always about effects on democracy. <laughs> I think hans Hermann Hoppe would like to hear this, <laughs> if I pronounce this in this way. <laughs> uh -huh. But you see, a much stronger effect of cognitive ability on positive politics than of wealth. And if you look at the different wealth levels of countries, we see that for the poor countries, wealth becomes more and more important for developed cognitive ability. But for the rich countries, wealth is nearly not more important to develop ability, but ability becomes more and more important to f go further to progress in economic productivity, because modernization increases cognitive challenges. And here we see the higher the level of cognitive ability, even the stronger become the effects. There are no diminishing returns. I have done this study with Thomas Coyle and US American um, psychologists. So why is cognitive ability relevant at the level of nations? First of all, cognitive ability increases at similar level of individuals, efficiency, rationality, and so we have aggregated effects at the level of nations. But now I will come to show some work or refer to some work of socio sociologists. Like yesterday we had some bashing of uh, sociology, but there are really good sociologists who have done uh, important work. For example, Norbert Elias, he has shown in his studies that, uh, that there's an interconnection between 
psychological development and development of society between psychogenesis and sociogenesis. People's attributes have an effect on institutions, and institutions again have an effect on the development of individuals. And last, here I cite the work of, Hi um, of Garrett Jones, he's an economist from George Mason. Mason. A hive mind, he, he has termed um, this phenomenon. There are positive interaction effects, multiplier effects, um, because smarter people, for example, better cooperate, they make mess, less mistakes, and in groups with, with smarter people, the effect of cognitive ability is boosted. So, I spoke about the positive effects of cognitive ability on the development of nations. But are there any differences in cognitive ability across nations? Yes, there are huge differences. And this is a new, new information we had not had 20 years ago. 20 years ago, uh, people, scientists, all believe more or less that all countries are similarly smart. And if there are differences, it's only due to um, problems of testing or maybe some uh, um, not enduring differences, for example, in nutrition. But today we know, due to the student assessment studies and due to the work of Richard Lin, who collected many intelligence test results, that there are very, very large differences in cognitive ability between countries. Let's give only three examples. TIMS is a study in math and sci in science at, in, for 10-year-old students, pupils. The lowest result was found in Yemen, 200 points in student assessment scale, it's about IQ 56, the largest uh, values in Korea, about 590, difference of one, more than 100 IQ points, and of about, calculated, 11 years of school. And the same you can find in other studies, in PISA or in IQ study, there are very, very large differences. <clears throat> Here's a map of the Average results in the world, the lowest results are found in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and the highest in East Asia, followed by North Europe, Middle Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand, and then Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Latin America, Arabian countries, uh, um, uh, India, Southeast Asia. So we have, we have shown there's a, huge, there's a very important impact of ability on the development of nations that there are large differences. But are these differences stable? Yes, they are stable. They are first stable across different studies. I have done here statistical analysis, factor analysis. We, we, we use this frequently in psychology. And we have here, at maximum, we can have loadings at one. And the higher the loading, that means the more similar are the results in different tests. And we are seeing here the results of TIMS, of PEARLS, of PISA, different scales, literacy, math, science in different years, and psychometric intelligence tests here too, and former old studies in student achievement, and they more or less converge uh, at one very strong G factor. The results are very similar, not always identical. For example, Austria 2000 PISA, the results were a little bit too good, but in other, in other studies, uh, the results were uh, highly uh, replicated. And we have stability across environments. East Asians are good in East Asia and in North America. Vietnamese are good in Vietnam and in Germany. Japanese are good in Japan and South and North America. And Sub-Saharan Africans show low ability results in Africa and South and North America, but at a clearly higher level in North America. In Africa, we have results on average about 70, and in America, 85 and a little bit higher. And there we see there can be a positive change depending on environment. And also important for America to know uh, about 23% of the uh, genetic heritage of blacks, of Af Af African Americans, is uh, of European descent. And these results are not only stable across tests, across, across um, environment, but also across time. Here we have positive correlations. For example, of the technological level, 1,000 years before uh, the common era, before Christ, with today's cognitive ability level correlation of 0.48. And so you have across time, with different indicators of cognitive achievement, of intellectual achievement, or of wealth, you have always positive correlations. 
And also economists have found this pattern. I will cite here two, two studies. The evidence suggests that economic development is affected by traits that have been transmitted across generations over the very long run, biologically and culturally. This is written by economists. Or another quote, our regression discontinuity, and et cetera, et cetera, shows a strong association between pre-colonial ethnic institutional traits and contemporary regional, regional development. Why is this so? Why we have such a strong stability, or large stability across time? Maybe due to path effects, if the parental generation has created a beneficial environment, the, the children are grown up in this environment and will again reproduce this uh, aspects of environment, or due to culture, or due to genetic effect, both here was mentioned here uh, uh, by the first uh, scientist. So, I want to, I have shown that ability level is important for the development of societies, that there's a large difference, and that these differences are stable across tests, environment, and time. What we know today about the difference between natives and immigrant inability. Maybe it could be that there are coming people from, on average, lower ability countries, but the, the elite is coming. Or maybe the environmental quality, of, for example, United States schools or German educational system or what else, or France, uh, um, even if it's not so good, it's better than in the developing countries, is so good that the immigrants could catch up and achieve the similar, a similar level. However, that is not true, except we have in all country, nearly in all countries, except for, for Gulf countries and Australia, we have the pattern that the natives' ability level is higher than the ability level of the immigrants. Only in the Gulf countries, there's a large positive gap favoring immigrants and a small positive gap for, for Australia. And the largest negative or very large negative in the West, Western world we can find here in Scandinavia and in Central Europe, in Germany, there's a difference between natives and immigrants average cognitive ability level of eight IQ points. And here I calculated the gains or losses by migration, also considering the percentage of immigrants, the more, the larger is the percentage, the larger are the effects, and the, the most, the largest negative effect we can find for Central Europe, because we have many immigrants at a relatively low level, but uh, consider the recent refugee immigration is not included, we have until now no numbers. Blue means immigrants have higher levels. Australia, Gulf countries, and Ireland, Kyrgyzstan, Moldavia, and this is but Molda Moldavia and Kyrgyzstan, we have not so much reliable data. Have migrants on average the home, the home country ability level? Yes, on average it is, this is true. Usually immigrants represent about the average of their country of, of origin. There are some important exceptions Iranians in the US, Indians in the US and West, South Africans in Australia and New Zealand. And we have here, oh, sorry. And we have here some systematic research based on PISA by a Dutch sociologist, Jaap Tronkos. He reanalyzed PISA data and he has shown that the ability level of immigrants of one country are roughly similar across different uh, um, immigration countries. For example, the Portuguese, the would mean the Portuguese in Germany are similar to the Portuguese in Luxembourg. Not identical, but similar. They have similar ability levels. And if you want to predict ability level immigrants, it is more important to look at the home country, the country of origin ability level, than at the ability level of the receiving country. When you want to know the ability level, for example, of um, of Arabians in Germany, you have not to look at the ability level of, of Germans, but at the ability level of Arabians. Here, a strong effect of home country. But there's also some effect of the receiving country. There's no zero effect. And you can compare the ability levels directly of the two, of the, of the Im immigrants with the home country, with the country of origin. And there's only a gain of one IQ point by selection or modification. And the Spanish, 
researcher Julio Cabana comes to the result, another one, not, not wrong course, immigration hardly affects students' PISA scores, which remain at the level of the country of origin and do not come closer to the level of the destination country. So, I have shown the ability is important, there are huge differences, they are stable, and they are replicated by the immigrants. What will be now the effects of immigration? We can do a, such a, a syllogistic talk, we can apply logical reasoning like, as in, like an, an aspect of intelligence based on previous robust empirical results with strong theoretical background the immigration of people of low cognitive human capital will show negative consequences for economy and society. However, two qualifications, immigrant groups differ. The immigrants from Vietnam, from Vietnam are different to the immigrants, for example, from Mexico, or the, the, the ability level from, from China, Chinese is different from the ability level of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, cognitive ability is not all, personality also counts. And what is always correct, I've not mentioned until now, individual differs. There may be smart people from Africa and dull people from China. They exist. But on average, the ability levels are not in this way. What are the economic and fiscal effects of the last immigration waves calculated by I, I choose here only very highly reputable scientists as sources. This, uh, the first source is uh, Bernd Raffehüschen, he's an economist in Freiburg, and he said that the least last refugee immigration wave will cost about 17 billion euro per year in Germany. Even if the immigrants are integrated within six years into the labor market, the additional long-term costs will be around 900 billion euro. 900 billion euros, it's incredibly high. If qualification integration would need more time, the costs will be considerably higher. Another economist from Kiel, he calculated costs of 55 billion per year. Others, like Le Grain, who is um, paid by a refugee support organization, came to more positive results. For past immigrants, Hans Werner Sinn from Munich, also a very highly respected econom economical economist in, um, in Germany, he has calculated the costs of about 1,800 euro per year. And Holger Bonin, economist from Mannheim, he calculated that the past immigration, not the, not the, not the now, but the past immigration, cost per life an immigrant about 79,000 euro per life, compared to 3,000 euro per life for a uh, native. Maybe this sounds strange for you, how could it be always negative? It is negative because we are increasing death and death um, from generation to generation. That means immigrants show a 25 times higher, greater loss compared to natives. And even in Canada, you have a negative effects of immigration. Amy, Canada and in Germany, if you look at the newspapers and so on, it's always seen as a positive example how to deal with immigration. Oh, look at Canada, how they are doing this so well. But it's not, do, not done well, because also in Canada, the effects are negative. One, one average immigrant costs per year $6,000, and, and altogether, depending on the number of immigrants, costs per year $24 billion or $16 billion Canadian dollar. And these, these calculations did not include very important costs. The, the costs of crime are really, really high. In, I think many of you will know the calculations, how much costs, for example, a murder or a rape. Um, uh, economists have tried to calculate um, uh, the costs of, of crime, and these are all not in included in the former, former studies. Dealing with crime, we have one problem. Byron wrote, this is a, he has written a book about diversity effects, has described it six years ago, that in reading through the literature on crime among immigrants, some from reputable resources and others more anecdotal, one is stuck, struck by the absence of sound government statistics. There are no really good governmental official statistics. This is still today the case. There are many somewhat hidden single reports, but usually the ethnic or religious background is not mentioned. 
and of course two qualifications. Immigrants are not identical to different immigrants from different countries. There are huge differences. And of course, men show much more crime than women, and younger men much more than older men. And especially risk group seems to be immigrants from a certain geographical, cultural background. This is an opaque um, term. Um, uh, we want to continue this conference also in the next years, so I have chosen this uh, term. Kierkegaard, this is not a philosopher, this is a da young Danish linguist um, who has given up to study linguistics. He has done uh, some studies to predict the crime level of individual immigrants in different countries, and he's shown that this geographical cultural background is predictive for crime. It's similar predictive to home country EQ, but more predictive than home country GDP. And the similar level you have for the Netherlands. So the cultural or geographic effects are robust across countries and controls. And a second study from Noah Kahl. Noah Kahl is a young sociologist from Oxford. He has tried to predict terrorism level in different Western countries. And the terrorism level in Western countries is higher the more persons you have of, of uh, a group with a certain geographical background. And this is a very robust results. Also, um, um, uh, integrating controls like uh, GDP. And this is exactly that what have said the East European politicians like Václav Klaus or uh, Viktor Orban who said, no, we do not want these immigrants because we do not want to have certain aspects which are not beneficial for our societies. One ex example from German-speaking countries, sexual assault in public swimming pools. There's nothing new under the sun this was first reported from a similar group in the 60s in Paris from Spiegel. Spiegel is the most important German news magazine. In 50 years ago, you found these, these things, but today it's really difficult to find such uh, reports. What they have written 50 years ago, Parisian women, women get spoiled babbling in pools. Where there is paddling a single bikini, she is shortly encycled above and below water by this term we would not use today anymore, brownish swimmers. 10 or 20 Algerian hands pull their fasteners or rob her the textile. Consequence, the bathing girls avoid the pools and also their male friends. Spirited pool attendants who venture to step in towards freebooters, also to try to control them, were after work threatened by hostile routes. Parisian police was set to the task to cope with a colony of 200,000 Algerians, which represents only 3% of the capital's population, but which is responsible for 32% of homicides, 39% of car thefts, and 58% of theft using firearms. What is not here <coughs> written, you need to consider age differences <coughs> and uh, uh, um, sex differences, also if there are more male young Algerians compared to um, French. This is not done here, but I assume and still today, even if you do this, <coughs> you come to higher rates. We have this, this was written 50 years ago. We have the similar problem today in Germany, <coughs> Austria, and, and, and other countries. What is not written here in this report is um, we have today also problems with terrorism and some psychopathical violence I will later shortly mention. You cannot find this in, in traditional German newspapers, but there are privately organized news blogs or people, for example, this, this site, Einzelfall Map, run by four women and one man who count every, for example here, swim bath occurrence, swimming pool occurrence. One example, from one day in the summer, on 21st of July, we had sexual assaults in Lower Saxony, in Hesse, in Baden-Württemberg, in Bavaria. We had them in North Rhine-Westphalia, we had them also in Austria. We have also sexual abuse on slides and showers in changing rooms violence against other guests not following the instruction of pool supervisors. When I was in summer in West Germany in a swimming pool, I have seen first time in my life that there is security service. I asked, my, I asked one of my uncles, he'll, he will become 80 years this year, he lived in 
four different German-speaking countries. He lived in National, National Socialist Deutsche Reich. He lived in Socialist Eastern Germany. He lived in Western Germany. And he is living now since 40 years in Austria. He lived in, in three different political systems, four different um, German um, speaking countries, and he had made so many trips when he was younger in his life to all over the world and I asked him, have you ever seen in your life security service in the swimming pool? And he said to me, no, he has never seen in his life anywhere security service. And these are also additional costs we have to add to the costs before mentioned. For example, violence in sports, here are also many times mad violence, like done by Zinedine Zidane in, the, in his fast game, and the uh, and the uh, final game of the uh, uh, Capo Mundial, I don't know how to say in English. Or you have pathological violence against own wife, against own children, against relatives. For example, in 2014, an Afghan dentist killed in religious delusion his own family. You have rape and group sex, sexual assault, Cologne, Stockholm, riots, France, Sweden, England. And you have increasing violence against Jews in Belgium and France, Sweden, starting also in Germany. And this leads to the Jews decamp for Israel. More and more Jews are going to Israel. And these were special effects of a special kind of immigration. But you have also effects of diversity. I will conclude. I will be ready in six, six, seven minutes. Hmm? <clears throat> We have also diversity effects independent of the special characteristics of the immigrants. The ability level of the natives is somewhat affected by diversity, but the ability level of the immigrants is much more affected by diversity. It means the more immigrants you have in a class, the lower will be the average achievement level, average learning level in a school. And this is one important result that all these negative effects are less serious for the average native, but they are more serious for the just existing immigrants or just for the coming immigrants. The people who mostly benefit of fewer immigrants are the immigrants themselves. Then you have a negative effect of, of, on trust. Diversity decreases trust, have a negative effect, impact on economy and society. And Diversity reduces the willing for re redistribution. Last week, I found a result, an uh, example for this. Um, I've read that food banks receive less and less support in Germany. The newspapers have written that the, new, that the food banks who give food away to poor people, the food banks receive less food because of shelf life and competition. But there were no changes in the last five to 10 years in shelf life or competition. There was only a change in last year in, in the composition of people who go into the food bank. Now, more, I don't know the numbers, but I, I assume about half or a little bit more refugees are going to the, to the food banks. We have also effects on science. We will find more studies on stereotypes, prejudices, racism, and multiculturalism, diversity. We'll have politicization of research ignoring research coming not to politically wished results, which is frequently labeled as being right, racist, or similar. And if it's something right or racist, it's not true. It's, it's assumed. We'll have more cloud cuckoo land and commissioned research coming to the expected results. One, res one example is, res is research of TENT. TENT is a refugee supportive organization. They found that investing one euro in refugees will have economic benefits. I think this is true. If you invest money in education, in, in training, human capital training, this will have a positive impact. But then they concluded, we need also anti-discrimination laws, and they concluded that, that the refugees as a group will have a positive impact on the economy and society. And this last is not true. The first is true. If you invest, you will have usually a positive effect. But the last, that the, that the refugee immigration will have positive impact on society, is certainly not true. We have problems in research. For example, the results of stereotype accuracy research are not read 
are not accepted. Um, the average correlation between stereotypes and criteria is about 0.81. There's nothing, there's no social, psychological result that is more true than stereotypes. You can predict with stereotypes uh, very good at a group level uh, average behavior of people or average results of people. And we have a problem in the social sciences but also in psychology that the, that the political diversity is less and less reduced and becoming the, the political milieu at university becomes more and more left-wing. We have, for example, in the United States, 14 left-wing psychologists for one right-wing, or 40, 14 liberal for one uh, conserv conservative. We have also the effects of media. Media bias produce a biased view. One example from uh, Sweden. Police in Finland have questioned eight Swedish men following claims a woman was gang raped on a Viking line ferry in Finnish waters over the weekend. Eight Swedish men had made this. On close inspection, this was a newspaper. And this was what you, what you can find in newspapers. And this you can find in the internet in Gatestone Institute. On close inspection, it turned out that seven of the eight suspects were Somalis and one was Iraqi. None of them had Swedish citizenship, so they were not even Swedish at that sense. And we have similar occurrences in Germany, for example. There was a story last year that Syrian refugees rescued a member of NPD. NPD is a Nazi following party, um, and, and Syrian refugees sh should have rescued him out of his burning car. But uh, bloggers had found out that there are no evidence for this uh, news and most probably it were other people, bus drivers, who rescued him. Or and there, was, we had, there was a flood um, in, in Germany and Austrian TV transported refugees to the houses and they wanted to film how refugees are helping um, um, uh, the natives against the flood. They are news produced uh, which is not true. Today is not, not more possible to inform oneself in standard media about certain subjects being inclined to political correctness. So you have to use other, others, other information like, like letters of readers if they are published or alternative news portals, but you use always to cross-check the information. Privately made pages, bloggers, or you need to search for non-PC key terms. Then you will find a totally different reality. <clears throat> and we have effects in politics. Affirmative action is demanded in public service, in parties, in companies, in police. And this was also described by Tilo Sarzin. For example, in Berlin, they are doing affirmative action for immigrants and to bring immigrants and police. They reduce the, the necessary uh, time without crime from 10 to 5 years. They reduce the the, the, what is necessary to have good German language command and the uh, examination requirements. So, now come my two last points. I've shown large differences. They are stable. Uh, there are differences between immigrants and natives. And there are, is a huge amount of empirical information on the effects of immigrants in Western uh, countries, not only in school, not only in economy, but also on the, in the sphere of culture. But how will it be the future? It could be like, like it was in the past argued for about revolution. We have now a kind of revolution. This is a transitory phase. We have to suffer now a little bit. Usually not we have to suffer, but other people, the poorer people or the, also the immigrants, they suffer a little bit. But in the future, they will become like a, a paradise of society. The ability levels will change. They will, they will become smarter and they will adapt and so on and so on. And there's some evidence that the ability level of immigrants is really rising. There are studies from the Netherlands showing the ability level is rising. And there's also studies from the countries who are sending immigrants, for example, for Turkey. The ability level of Turkey is rising from decade to decade. But for example, in Germany or in Sweden and so on, it's not rising anymore. And so the gaps between, for example, Turkey and Germany or Arabian countries in Germany or between immigrants and natives become smaller and smaller. That's some positive message. 
But we see also there's a pattern stability. And there are limits, limits of gap closing. Let's show you here results from the United States. About 50 years ago, there was a gap between blacks and whites of more than 15 IQ points. Today, only, only we have 10 IQ points. The same is more or less true for Hispanics. We have a, we have a smaller becoming gap, but the gap closing more or less stopped here. The gap closing stopped since 20, 30 years. And the same pattern we can found, the same pattern we, we can found for PISA TIMS results, we see an increase from the first to second generation, but this increase is, is becoming slower and slower, smaller and smaller. And the gap narrowing is especially limited in encapsulated communities. And if the communities become larger and larger and larger, the adaption will become smaller and smaller because they live in a separate world, less admixture and less contact to the uh, native population. So finally, what can be done? <clears throat> Usually are suggested some social strategies which are somewhat effective. Of our language courses, of course, language courses are, they learn, they learn the language, of our education for adults, of our human capital training, of our integration courses, offer for the youth, preschool, more school, discipline education, uh, improve school quality. I have shown that in a country where you use tests, central exams, or more autonomous schools, you have early enrollment, the gaps between natives and, and immigrants are smaller. Look for not too many immigrants in one class, look for uh, a certain admixture of the groups. And if it's not done, you have to do some consequences that the immigrants leave the country. But this will only help somewhat. What we need, we need also a change in immigration. We need a policy, we need a meritorious immigration policy. First of all, we need control of immigration. Um, the Princeton philosopher Michael Walzer has written about this, that countries have the collective right of admission refusal. Also, ex Oxford economist and migrant researcher Paul Collier, the control of immigration is a human right. The right to control immigration is asserted by all societies. You do not have the automatic right to move to Kuwait, nor do the Chinese have the automatic right to move to Angola. And for this, you need to control borders like is done by Spain. Many people, also the newspapers, the news, they do not know the positive example of Spain. Spain has done some contracts with North African countries that all immigrants that are coming are sent back. And this has also this result that there are very few fatal, a, fat, a very small fatality rate. Here, this is a presentation of Hans Werner Sinn. He has shown in Spain, we have in one year 100 death people, but in Greek, 800, and in central Italy route, 3,000. And why we have so few deaf people in Spain? Because they bring all back and so nobody will come. Same is done by Australia. Apply meritoric principles. Heckman, you think you know, is Nobel Prize winner in economy. He has suggested with his co-author Carnero, only skilled immigrants are permitted to enter the country. One way to do is to sell entry visas. This would screen out the unskilled. To sell. The other suggestion is by a, uh, by a, a lawyer, um, uh, Bradford, she suggested that immigrants should put a deposit of $50,000 in the immigration fund, and if they are successful, they will, will, will the money will be refunded. And not only the immigrants can pay in this fund, but also organizations or the employers. And they have all interest to only pay $50,000 for such persons who will be successful in the country, so they will not lose their money. The similar ideas were given by Gary Becker, Richard Posner, Julian Simon, and the idea is that markets, including banks, sponsors, or companies, would allo allocate entry permits to those who derive the greatest utility from migrating, and who are therefore willing to pay the highest price for the right to migrate. And young, healthy, productive people will have in a short time enough money to pay this back. This also includes, according to Gary Becker, also a Nobel Prize winner in economy, 
It also includes political refugees. If they don't have their own money, they can receive credits by banks or they can be paid by organizations. And some German or Swiss economists have suggested refund if they are successful. Or select for ability. Jason Richwein has suggested in his Harvard dissertation, no, don't ask for money. Look in tests. If you have a smart people, even without money, they will be effective, they will be efficient, they will be beneficial for the receiving country. Similar Richard Posner, a judge in the United States. Further steps, reduce social benefits, family chain immigration, recommended by Collier. Prefer cultural affinity if you receive immigrants, also suggested by Collier. And these are all very important, very famous, very highly reputable scientists at, at highly reputable institutions. But in Germany or in the European politics on immigration, nobody reads them, nobody uh, uh, um, takes their advice. But some qualification, be careful for selecting cognitive elites. If you take cognitive elites from developing countries, they are not anymore there. The, co the developing countries will suffer. And if you, if you take many smart immigrants, you will discourage your own youth. They will not invest more time to, for example, in STEM, as is, is described for the United States by Byron Root. Finally, my last page doesn't work more anymore. Start remigration. <clears throat> okay, I will I will tell you about uh, remigration. Immigrants with crime record, they sh should immigrate. Immigrates, they do not positively contribute to the economy and society. Use compulsory immigration. And if countries do not accept them, use money that they will accept them. Germany invests so much money in developing aid, also um, via European community, European Union. Um, this money could be also used for countries that they take back their um, immigrants. And if this does not work, Thilo Savatin has suggested that use force, use some ships and so on, and then they will take back their own people or bring them to other countries like done by uh, Australia. But most important, not, not remigration is the, is the solution. You have to control the borders and, and develop a meritorious immigration policy. Thank you very much for your attention.